Of the shooter franchises that emerged in the seventh console generation, being Xbox 360 and PlayStation 3, the Fear franchise remains a sore spot for many players. Fear 1, and to a lesser extent, its expansions, are fondly remembered FPS horror hybrids that established a unique world and pacing unlike anything else on the market at the time. Its sequel, Fear 2 Project Origin, is often regarded as a technically solid, if unremarkable, follow-up. But the third and final game in the series isn't often thought of as fondly, if it's thought of at all. Released to tepid reviews in 2011, Fear 3 was recognized as a solid and fun shooter by fans and critics alike, but criticism was leveled at nearly every other aspect of the title. Many complained it didn't feel as good to play as previous games in the series, that in implementing co-op and a scoring system, the game had lost much of its tension and horror, and that the story was disappointing and poorly told. But how did one of the most fondly remembered horror franchises of its era end with such a whimper? Why did it include co-op in an arcade-like scoring system? What was the involvement of celebrated horror icons John Carpenter and Steve Niles? To answer these and many more questions, I asked the people who would know best. The developers who wrote, designed, directed, and created the game. I sat down with seven of the game's developers from various disciplines, and along the way I discovered a story unlike any other I've heard in the game industry. The true story of Fear 3 isn't about shooting soldiers and getting surprised by ghosts. Instead, the story of Fear 3 is one of corporate interference, unrealized brilliance, and regrettably, depression, anxiety, and burnout. Getting the Fear 3 story straight isn't an easy thing to do. Fear 3's development isn't a timeline that starts with conception and ends in the game the developers wanted. It's an ever-spreading web where every strand spins into a new tangent that was fraught with new problems for the team to grapple with. But in an effort to simplify as much of the game's lifespan as possible, it's best to start at the very beginning. In 2005, Monolith released Fear, first encounter Assault Recon to critical acclaim. Soon after, however, a merger would result in one company, Warner Brothers, having the rights to the characters of the Fear universe, while another company, Vivendi, kept the rights to the franchise name itself. Basically, basically like Monolith, I think, was still kind of in control of the characters and stuff, which is, um, I think, if you look early on for Fear 2, it doesn't actually have the name Fear in it. It was just called Project Origin. When I joined them, uh, they had been uh, working with, uh, which at the time was Vivendi uh, and Universal, to uh, begin the development of Fear 2. And this happened because Monolith uh, was part of uh, Warner Brothers and Time Warner, I think at the time, uh, had a split with Vivendi. And so Vivendi got the Fear license and uh, wanted to make the continue the franchise, uh, but uh, ironically, they weren't able to take any of the characters, weapons, uh, anything from the previous Fear game. And that was because they weren't legally allowed to use the name until all the name, all the rights to everything, kind of fell under one roof when it when everything fell under Warner Brothers. So then uh, there was some shifting around once Warner Brothers owned everything on their side. And I think that that, 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 uh, that had an effect on what story they were going to tell uh, for the original Fear versus, for the original Fear 3, which was originally going to be called Fear 2, um, but without any of the characters from the original game. Uh, so we set out to make Fear 2, which is going to be a brand new Fear game with brand new characters and brand new everything. And that continued for... Um, a couple of years. So uh, originally our game was going to be very different than what Fear 3 ended up being. Without the use of the characters, places, and events of the first Fear game, Day One had to take a different approach to telling the story of the horror shooter sequel, though the team still wanted to maintain the balance of action and supernatural horror that had made the original a hit. Yeah, I think there was the idea was that like the the squad the fear squad was still the only like consistent narrative element like we were going to basically tell another story um just without any of those characters we were going to tell another supernatural story entirely uh it was going to be based around kind of what was known as the philadelphia experiment and this idea that uh, soldiers and and technology would allow people to phase in and out of our reality and uh so the, the basis of it was that uh, you were the fear squad and you were essentially going to be fighting against 
uh, you know, some of these bad players who had, had acquired this technology to be able to sort of phase in and out of our, our, our existence in our worlds and uh, wreak all kinds of havoc. For this documentary, I was able to procure concept art from throughout Fear 3's development, including concepts that were scrapped from Day 1's original Fear 2. In the concept art, we can see plans for the Phase Soldier, a cancelled enemy that would be able to shift between realities. Fear 2's reality merging conceits also set up some other horrifying enemies that players would encounter. There's no shortage of concept art, much of it by industry artist Grant Hillier, depicting more paranormal enemies that seem to be the result of either experimentation gone awry or an unknown malevolent force. While there are influences from John Carpenter's The Thing and even Dead Space, these wildly creative concepts paint a picture of a team ready to take such familiar imagery and make it their own. There are even a few pieces of art that seem to lay the groundwork for enemies like the Scavengers and the Creep in the final version of Fear 3. But most amazingly were the concepts drawn for the world behind the walls, a hellish alternate dimension that, if the concept art is anything to go by, was planned for the player to be able to explore at some point in the story. The concepts for the world behind the walls are strange and bizarre. They show skeletal, otherworldly structures and unreal geometry. There are even some that feature what appear to be ambient wildlife. These are bold creative visions to be sure, and while it's unlikely that Day 1's original vision for Fear 2 would have resulted in something as wild and complex as these landscapes, it's still a bummer to see what might have been and never was. As a fan of horror, concept art, and the supernatural, it was a treat to be able to see these concepts, but also an experience tinged with disappointment. Here was the work of countless artists pushing themselves to make something unique and interesting, taking a concept and making it their own with little to no creative constraint. But Day One's ambitious concepting and over a year of development on their version of Fear 2 would never see the light of day. At that time, uh, then there was another merger where uh, Warner and uh, uh, Universal, I'm sorry, Viveni gave uh, the license or sold it back to Warner Brothers. And at that time, uh, Monolith, who had made Fear 1, which was an amazing game, uh, had been working on their own Fear 2, which they couldn't call Fear 2, but was called Project Origin. And so, uh, because of that, they decided, okay, we're going to make Project Origin Fear 2, and we're going to make the, guy, the game that you guys are working on will become Fear 3. Uh, and, and understand, too, that what our Fear 3 started out as evolved to, it changed uh, quite a bit from when we started it until we ended it. Uh, so if I can remember the chronology. So uh, suddenly we had all the Fear universe back. We could use Alma. We could use, you know, uh, the, all of the characters from Fear 1 and Fear 2. Uh, so that was a pretty much a total reboot of the, uh, the narrative, the uh, kind of the, the, the backstory of our game. So uh, all of our sort of phase soldiers and uh, uh, you know, our, our thoughts about this, we had this idea of the, called the world behind the walls uh, and all this sort of parallel universe stuff kind of went away. Uh, but we did take along this idea of, of, of phasing and, and a technology that would allow soldiers to essentially kind of, uh, you know, beam in and out of our world. So one of the enemies in Fear 3 is this heavy uh, phase soldier and, and sort of so he can kind of zap into a scene and create this sort of energy field and then spawn soldiers around him, basically. So I think that was the only element uh, that really survived from Fear or our Fear 2. So with Day One's unique take on Fear put on the back burner, the team now had a mandate to not only make a sequel to Monolith's second Fear game, but to fit within a now established universe and framework that Monolith had made their own. Monolith left behind some large boots to fill, but by all accounts the team at Day One were ready and willing to fill them. 
Uh, but yeah, by the, by the time that kind of merger happened and the, you know, Fear 2 separated into Project Origin and Fear 3, um, there was at least some dialogue between the teams, for sure, just because, you know, you want to, you want to, we wanted to make the, we wanted to make it genuine. We wanted to make it a genuine fear game. We didn't just want to, you know, throw the name Paxton Fettel, throw Al Alma, throw all that around. We wanted to make it an actual um, entry in the series. Basically, the guys at Monolith, because at that, because like at the time, uh, you know, Monolith was its own thing, and then if they became a Warner Brothers studio, and so the, some of the guys at Monolith came. Uh, to help out, uh, help us out with the project since so much had drastically changed. Um, they, they sent over a, a couple of guys and, uh, and they kind of had their own idea. They had their own uh, thought on what they wanted to do with the story. And so we just, we, they, we sat, we talked it out, we kind of hashed it out with everybody and we, um, and we said, okay, well, we'll take this and we'll, um, and we will, uh, this is what we'll do. This is what we'll build. Um, there were, there were limitations to it. Uh, we had already built assets and things like that. Um, so uh, for the for the earliest iteration of the game, um, they had already built some assets that we were trying to preserve. And we didn't, I don't think we preserved everything, but we preserved quite a bit. And so we um, had to kind of make the story fit with what was, with some of the stuff that was already built. Some things were rebuilt from the ground up. Um, and then, yeah, it was really neat because I did play through uh, the first fear and then got, we got early builds of Fear 2 um, to play through before it was released so we could better try to align ourselves. And it was, it was cool because there were development builds too. So we, we got to sort of you know, play the release builds before it was released. Um, but for myself, I felt an enormous amount of pressure to try and... Um, to try and fit the game into the existing narrative, which is in and of itself incredibly uh convoluted <laughs> and uh and and strange and so uh the I, the one of the earliest like while i was uh, you know when i first came onto the project one of the things that i did was yeah i played through uh i played through the game and uh the first game uh and then i also we also had builds of uh fear 2 uh project origin that had because the game i don't think had shipped yet so we were playing um, we were playing developer builds of that at the time as well, or at least I was playing developer builds of that at the time to see like where they were um, and like what what direction they were taking that stuff. And I know, um, I know TJ was very uh, very well aware of of like the direction and and, and the changes and, and stuff like that that were going on for Project Origin and um, and you know by proxy then like Steve and those guys were 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 also. Um, were also involved or, or aware of that stuff. I think that, um, but like for me, like the way I felt it, it was my first sort of writing gig in the industry. So I really wanted to get it right. And so I played the, I played the other two games constantly and tried to, um, tried to work in, uh, I tried to walk this line between the, uh, the sort of direction I knew that, uh, that like, um, the guys from Monolith, uh, from Monolith slash Warner Brothers, uh, wanted to take it and trying to keep the uh, trying to keep it uh, in 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 tune with the rest with the other with the other two games, um, which was uh, which was sort of like a just this little balancing act because they wanted to push the narrative forward and they also really wanted to focus on the relationship between Point Man and Fettel, um, which is something that the first two games don't really focus on. That. I mean, they, they, you know, it's, it's sort of like a big reveal at the end of the first game that, that Fettel is your brother. And so like the first game doesn't really spend a lot of time with that. And then the second game, you're not even playing as point man. So, um, so they have, they were trying to like figure out how to like sort of focus on that relationship and their relationship with Alma while, uh, uh, and, and part of my job was to try my hardest to make sure that like, at least from moment to moment, the, that the uh, that it seemed like something that could exist in the same universe, and someone else would have to say whether or not we uh, uh, whether or not uh, whether or not that was successful or not. I um, 
I sort of go back and forth on that a little bit. I think in some places it works better than others. In taking over the story of Fear's main characters, the silent protagonist Point Man and the first game's villain Paxton Fettel, the team at Day One dug deep into redesigning the characters, focusing on fleshing them out in ways the original never could, while also digging into their shared traumatic past as experimental test subjects. The designs for Point Man originally centered around him fleeing to South America after the events of the first game. The original fear never showed Point Man's face, so the team took the opportunity to tell his story through design, concepting a gruff military look for the stoic silent protagonist. His undead brother Fettel took a different approach. While the team drew explicitly from his Fear 1 design, they also explored other, more ghoulish interpretations to depict him as a sadistic specter. In the end, Fettel's appearance took a more restrained approach, with visibly mottled skin and prominently featuring the bullet hole delivered by Point Man at Fear 1's conclusion. As part of the production reboot from Fear 2 to Fear 3, an entirely new story would also need to be penned, an undertaking guided by Stephen Dinehart through its first iterations. I was basically brought in to doctor the reboot. So um, when I joined the team, um, you know, there was a lot of, I'll say development. That I believe they had been in development at that point for about 18 months. And uh, they believed it was going to be essentially Fear 2, um, and so that's when I was brought in uh, to help kind of take all the work or as much of the work as I could um, and uh, salvage it uh, for uh, the new project. I wasn't, um, you know, part of the reason I was brought in is because they weren't very happy uh, with the vision. And I won't say that, I mean, the vision itself was neat and it was a cool vision, um, but it wasn't really fear. Um, and suddenly the game really had to be fear. Uh, with all the characters um, and in alignment in the franchise. So it had to, what should I say, with the canon of the franchise. Um, and um, so they, they really had to take it back. I did, I mean, I couldn't tell you how many different versions of that story I pitched and developed. Um, some of them were pretty uh, robust. Um, you know, I, I understand, I'm a game developer um, and, you know, I didn't lead the pack on it, um, but I was certainly one of the lead voices there. And because I had no prior commitment to really a lot of the work that had been done, I could kind of hack and slash it um, a little more efficiently than some people that might be attached to it. You know, there was a really, frankly, a lot of burnout on the team at that time because there was a lot of passion for the project. And then all of a sudden they realized um, that basically it was all for naught. Um, so, yeah, as I tried to make sense of what um, the new campaign uh, that we were creating would be. You know, I did my best, um, less so from a business standpoint. I wish I could say there were some incentives for me to save money from a business standpoint and not waste time and energy to redevelop assets, but there really isn't a lot of incentive, a lot of incentives to do that. So um, my only incentive in it, it is that I, um, as a developer, understand the time and passion that goes into things. And they had some really great stuff developed. So I did my best to try to integrate everything that had already been created as much as possible and where it fit, where it fit right. Yeah, it was, you know, an exciting opportunity. It was a strange and interesting story about this creepy little girl. Um, and, um, yeah, I mean, so it was a, a very interesting setting to work within. And one of the fun things I like about working within settings uh, that have such strong fandom is surprising people and giving them something new. Now, this was really hard, um, I think, mostly because Fear 2 really threw some strange loops out there. Um, and so it was a challenge to try to, because it, it really was a great leap, I think, from what Fear 1 was. Um, and to try to sort of fit between those with Fear 3, to try to make sense of them all, um, was a challenge. Now, you know, I can't say I was happy. You know, I've tried to play the games a couple times, um, and it's hard for me um, because I see all the things that changed. And there's some things I 
a lot I still love about it, but some things I still, just, you know, the creative in me is still fighting. Like, man, why didn't they? We could have done so much more here. We could have done so much more here. You know, and the the scares and just I don't know. I um I don't think it's as strong as it could have been. As is normal in the game industry, Dinehart left the project after his contract was completed, with Corey Lanham coming in to help guide the narrative from there. But in the press releases and coverage for the game, Dinehart and Lanham didn't get nearly as much mention as some of the other credited contributors to Fear 3's narrative, namely horror legend John Carpenter and 30 Days of Night scribe Steve Niles. But from the team members I spoke to, it seems like their involvement may have been ultimately little more than a PR move, and may have in fact hurt the production more than it helped. I have been waiting to talk to somebody about those two idiots. Um, basically, the lead producer and I wanted to go with a guy named Brian Keane. He's written a lot of books, he's got a really unique take on zombies, um, and just, we thought it'd be a much better fit. The publisher demanded that we use Steve Niles, um, and John Carpenter. To the best of my knowledge, when I, I left the project before it was completely finished, and in the time I was there, John Carpenter did absolutely nothing. It's like we licensed his name and that was about it. And Steve Niles was slow on deliverables. He was laid on nearly every deliverable. There was one point where he was out of touch and we found out he was appearing at Dragon Con when he owed us deliverables for the story. Um, it was a less than ideal relationship with both of those gentlemen. You know, although my narrative uh, was handed over to Corey um, on my departure, you know, it's sort of typical in the uh, game writing space. At least it's happened to me way too many times. I, I hand over a script um, and that uh, tends to terminate my contract. They say, thanks so much for your work. We're going to go into development with this now. Um, so it was a good lesson for me. You know, here I was managing uh, Steve Niles and John Carpenter uh, for Warner Brothers um, as part of my writing staff, uh, but they had very different contracts than I had. Uh, they had uh, WGA contracts. They came out of Hollywood. Um, so they didn't have to be on site. Um, they didn't have the same sort of uh, constraints as developers. I wanted to bring in John as far as we could because I thought it was an amazing opportunity. Um, but it basically boiled down to him, which it was amazing, don't get me wrong. I loved interfacing with him anyway I could. We had him on some calls, bounced ideas. Um, I never met him in person, um, but he would give me notes on my scripts um, and sort of we bounced ideas off of him. And that was really the extent of it. You know, I tried to get him to do an on site, but it was going to cost us like another hundred thousand dollars or something like that. I don't remember what he wanted for it. Um, just to show up at the studio for a day. Um, so we could, you know, really get into the meat of it. But, you know, regardless, it was still an honor working with him. It was really cool to get notes back on stuff I had written from the master of horror. Right. Um, Steve Niles was a, his, his contract, uh, was a little, well, a lot more involved than John's. Um, and he uh, was a key writing asset uh, for us um, in the development of the story. Steve was an interesting asset um, and he has a lot of clout. Um, I wasn't very happy with a lot of his deliverables, frankly. Um, and a lot of it had to be completely rewritten. And uh, that's, I guess, as much as, as much as I'll say, hey, because of the sort of celebrity contract he had, I don't think he had a very much influence on the game. And I, to be honest, didn't get the impression um, that he was very invested in it. I had more interaction with Steve than I did with John, but I do remember having, uh, having multiple phone calls, um, uh, conference calls with, uh, with John on the line to talk about specifically, uh, mainly, uh, mainly high level, uh, high level stuff when it came to um when it came to cinematics and and sort of how those were going to uh fit into the game um i didn't write cinematic although i i, I honestly couldn't tell exactly who wrote some of the cinematic stuff i because that stuff was all kind of off um that was siloed off in a different area i was i had my work cut out for me in the in-game stuff and so um uh I know Steve wrote a couple of different drafts of uh, of the script uh, early on, um, 
uh, my, like I said, my work was mainly focused on the, in, uh, the gameplay stuff because I had to be there to be able to, to react quickly to any sort of changes we made during the production. But uh, we kept, obviously we kept Steve abreast of everything. So, you know, I think the short version is, is you know, Steve Niles worked with TJ and Frank to really kind of help uh, create the story of the brothers and the narrative of them kind of going back and telling the story of them, you know, being, you know, subjects in this sort of pseudo military medical facility getting operated on by, uh, uh, you know, by Harlan Wade, uh, them, you know, kind of diverging paths where, you know, point man was sort of becoming, you know, more of a soldier, but had the, the slow mobility where his fettle was kind of just going off the deep end and getting, you know, really more and more nuts. And uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the, the dichotomy between the two brothers, I think was the main thrust of what Steve Niles contributed uh, with TJ and Frank working with them. With John Carpenter, I would say, I couldn't really tell you what his footprint on the game was. I think there was maybe a couple of meetings where, you know, they just got together and they talked about the fear story and John kind of threw out some ideas and, they, you know, they probably took some of that stuff. But, you know, I would say that, you know, he was, uh, uh, they wrote him a check to get his name on the game and they got some good ideas from him probably, but I don't, he, I, he never came to the studio, never worked with the team. He never did anything beyond sort of just uh, kibitzing with TJ and Frank and probably some other designers. Um. So uh, I didn't interact with them that well, or the, or that much. Like I, I never really interacted with uh, um, with Steve and, and and John. I think I, I believe my understanding is that we sent John the sort of script and or showed him a video of what the game was about or something, and he said that's cool. Um, but I may be wrong about that. Uh, there are others who would be able to attest if he uh, had more of a of an input uh, than that. But I'm not sure that he did. I know that Steve Niles wrote a bunch um of it and was involved uh much much more than than john carpenter was with two fear games already made by monolith a template had been set for day one to follow and along with it fan expectations Fans of the first two Fear games expected frenetic and tightly paced shooter action, but also a healthy dose of psychological and supernatural horror. Day One worked hard to make sure Fear 3 would live up to those expectations. But Warner Brothers had other plans for the production. Most of the stuff they we wound up like jamming on and kind of playtesting wound up actually making it into the game. Um, I remember... So one of the big differences in the engine between um, between Fracture and Fear is they actually added a um, dismemberment system. And so I don't know if you remember, like you could shoot a guy with a shotgun in the leg and his leg would fly off. And that was all a system made by, I want to say this guy, Ryan McFall. Um, and I remember when we put that in and I just, it was back in the day when Jack Thompson was all in the news talking, you know, railing against violence in video games. And like, I just remember everybody crowded around his computer and it was one, uh, crowded around Ryan McFall's computer. And it was one of those, uh, you know, if only Jack Thompson could <laughs> see how much we're cheering on this dismemberment system. Um, he would have a field day and it was just yeah that was that was one of the big things um but yeah most of the like i a lot of the stuff they did early on in playtest and whatnot wound up becoming features of the game uh it was uh, it had started development a little bit um by the time we were wrapping up fracture and then it was just all right everybody all hands on deck for the next thing like let's, let's see if we can get this uh to happen um, and yeah, and uh, a bunch of the stuff was sort of, was relatively solid by the time we moved on. Um, uh, the, um, the nature of like 
how you're going to shoot things and you're going to have slow-mo and how much of it, how is, this, how is that going to behave? Um, how is the AI going to behave? Um, they had kind of prototyped all of that stuff. Um, I don't think that it had started as a, as a definitely co-op thing. Fear is at its core in the first game is a survival game, you know? You know, I got three shotgun shells. There's a monster around the corner. How am I going to deal with this? Uh, I'm really alone here. I'm in the shadows and the dark. Um, that was really the basis of fear, and I thought was really good. And, and Project Origin, I think, kind of progressed on that pretty well. What happened with Fear 3 is we started out making that kind of game. And then uh, Martin Tremblay, who was the head of Warner Brothers at the time, became very enamored with Call of Duty. And what we started getting was messages from them saying, look, we really need epic moments. We want big, like out of control world coming to an end type stuff. And we were really sort of taken aback because that was sort of not the game that we were making. We were not making a, we're not making Call of Duty, we're making fear and fear is really, uh, you know, you against an, an unbelievably, un, you know, terrifying force. And, that, uh, you know, that completely changed the nature of the game. And if you look at the reviews and the and hardcore fans, they'll tell you right away, this was not a scary game. Yeah, I was actually in charge of, I called it the scare team. And it was about 10 guys, all who had different experiences and uh, with different horror genres. So we had like Japanese horror, <clears throat> slasher horror, things like that. And we actually put together, we were creating what I call the scare toolbox. Um, to get like 10 or 15 different scare moments and be able to easily reuse those. Uh, but once the once the co-op came down, horror was pretty much out the window and that team went away and the scare toolbox never came to fruition. Um, we got the word from Warner Brothers that co-op is hot, make it a co-op game. And our response was co-op isn't frightening. Co-op isn't scary when you're playing with somebody else. And they didn't care because co-op was a buzzword in the industry at the time, and they demanded that we make a co-op. So we had to go back and retool all the levels to make them co-op compatible. To be honest, I believe that actually came from above. Like, I don't think anybody, certainly not myself or the designer I was working with, had any say in that. It was just like, hey, by the way, you're going to have a scoring system in this game. And I'm like, why? That's, that's not horror. That's... But to be fair, when we got the reviews came out, um, apparently a lot of people seem to like it. It seems to drive certain styles of gameplay, encourage people to use different weapons that they normally would. So whether or not that worked well for horror, uh, it did seem to improve the game or people seem to like it. Um, I mean, there was, uh, I mean, right up until we shipped, there was a sort of, um, uh, there was that question of, you know, can a co-op experience be, horror like can you feel that kind of response um and then even without the co-op nature of it even if you are playing it by yourself um you know you're still a super soldier shooting killing everything um so you know are there ways that we can really make you feel um like you're not that um the original fear did a pretty good job of that but a lot of it also was um your this was sort of the first time you were experiencing it. Um, so you didn't have the meta knowledge of, I've already done this three two other games. Um, you know, I can handle pretty much anything. Um, and uh, so we used a lot of the same tricks that the original Fear used. Um, but uh, there was definitely a concern of like, you know, are you, are you really gonna be worried? And so it was a lot of work to try to get the player into a space where they could feel like they maybe weren't in control of what was going on or they wouldn't be able to react to um, something that was about to happen um, and know they could handle it. Like they might, it would be uh, a surprise that they they can't just, you know, press slow-mo and, and shoot it to make it go away. The decision to make the game co-op would also impact level design which now had to accommodate players with drastically different abilities where there was once only one player expected in a game. There were some concerns about that. I remember there being some problems where it's like, okay, well, what happens if you have 
this person or that person, if you have, if you're playing as one player or as the other character, then making sure that the events happen that are supposed to, because otherwise, um, in particular, like if you're playing co-op specifically, then whoever's playing as the uh, Paxton character would have to take control of an enemy AI to open up a door so that the point man character could get through a door. But then if you're playing in single player, then you have to make sure like, okay, can point man get through there? We have to script a system so that the PC controls Paxton, he takes over that character and opens the door for you. Or if you're playing as Paxton, which is a thing that could happen, then making sure that you have a path to go forward. It's not really so much concerns as much as just realizing, yeah, this, this is what's going to happen. This is going to hurt the scariness of the game. But like I said, I don't, none of us had control of that. It was, just, it was decided from above that the scoring system was going in play. So there's, at that point, there's nothing to really complain about. You just have to do it. Supernatural enemies were one of the many planned tools for Fear 3's horror arsenal. Though, unfortunately, like Day 1's plans for Fear 2, many of the most intriguing concepts were left on the cutting room floor, including the Spectre, a gruesome enemy that would float around and fire projectiles at the player. There is no shortage of concept art for the Spectre, depicting them in a variety of outfits and poses, and even several concepts that depict them against in-game backgrounds, suggesting this was an enemy that was likely seriously considered to be put in the game, but had to be cut due to time constraints. However, two major supernatural enemies did make it into the final game. The Scavenger, a hellhound-like creature that would attack the player en masse, and the Creep, an ethereal manifestation of the trauma Harlan Wade inflicted on his daughter Alma and her son's point man at Fettel. The Scavenger went through several iterations, some much more insect-like and bizarre than others. Many of these designs call back to some of the previously explored concepts for the interdimensional monstrosities of Day 1 Sphere 2. As the form of the primary antagonist, the creep also went through a phase of iteration and exploration, but the team always knew the role they wanted the enemy to play, to make the player feel unsafe. Right. The creep, I think, was a big was a big part of that. Um, the, the creep, I don't remember if that was the full name, or the, the name we the, like made it onto wikis, but that's the, um, the sort of... Uh, personification of Harlan, the sort of weird um, spindly creature with the weird face. Um, uh, it was sort of a someone that we could have show up and actually grab you or interact with you, not just sort of be a, oh, that was a surprising thing for me to see. Like, oh, there's a little girl. Oh, that, that was creepy. I wasn't expecting that. Um, but actually having something that literally impacted the player's experience uh, in a direct way, even if just for a moment, um, to let you know that you can't really let your guard down uh, while you're playing. There were several different concepts explored, but in the end, the lanky skeletal form kept it fairly simple and straightforward. The turbulent development of Fear 3's story and horror elements were naturally reflected in the game's level design. From having to recontextualize large swaths of already created environments to fit a new story to accommodate in co-op, many of Fear 3's levels remained in a state of flux throughout production as the team tried to wrangle them into something with a compelling balance of narrative, gameplay, and scares. Among the levels were several that began as test areas or even leftover concepts from Day 1's original Fear 2, but some of the most compelling ideas for Fear 3 also got left on the cutting room floor. We wrote this really, at least, you know, uh, we worked really hard on the opening sequence. And it's sort of like the trailer um, that's out there that's used a bunch of times. Um, and, but uh, yeah, they, they didn't use the opening sequence. And I still read over it. I'm like, man, this would have been great. And it sort of just kind of, it's almost like it sort of just like cuts right into the middle of a title. And, um, for me, it's, it was sort of jarring because we had this really nice, I mean, it's got a nice uh, title sequence. The title sequence is really nice, but then it sort of just drops you into the game. And um, we had a really cool transition uh, plan that, you know, maybe, maybe it was expensive, but I don't think it 
was that expensive and who knows maybe you know i wasn't there at the end of the game maybe they built it right maybe they built it and it was cut because it was terrible or who knows the original thing we were going to try was an actual montage sequence um uh which would be about the idea was we would take portions of the game you were about to play um in you know five six second increments maybe slightly longer, maybe 10 um and just throw you into that scenario and uh and then you know we would do some sort of effect or, or you know screen effect or something and then change and you would go somewhere else and you would play a different part of the game from the future so it was kind of it was an attempt to sort of uh, almost a trailer sort of but a um to give you a sense of what you were in for but not really know when any of it's coming um and a little bit of an idea that um uh it's it's also a tie to alma and her uh knowledge sort of transcends uh, what's happening right now. Um, and so, you know, you were actually getting a glimpse to your literal future and we knew it would be because obviously we're making the rest of the game. Um, but it never really panned out. It was too difficult to, um, for you to understand the context of what was happening. So it mostly involved people would sort of show up and then not do anything because they were looking around trying to figure out what was happening. And then that section was over. Um, so, um, that was the main, uh, sort of, attempt to do something uh, different that sort of just didn't didn't really pan out. But um, I don't remember there being a lot of stuff lost, partially because we didn't have time to lose any stuff we were working on. Right. Um, it was more about figure out a way to make it fit because, you know, the clock's ticking, so. There's, I think that there's tons that I think I would have, I would have uh, liked to have put in. I think that's the story uh, with every game. Um, there's things that you'd like to get in or like to, uh, like to work in. I had, um, I had written and pitched a, and I, I don't, I don't think I have this anymore, but I had written and pitched a whole, um, idea for the opening of the game. Um, cause the game kind of opens, uh, if I remember, I'm sorry, I'm trying to remember if this is how it was, how it actually opens anymore. I think the game was originally supposed to open like, like in media res, like somewhere in like the, like towards the latter part of the game, like as like a preview of what's coming. And then you like, and then we take you and put you back like, you know, 12 hours later or whatever the fuck it, it would have been, but, um, or 12 hours earlier or whatever. But like the, um, so like I had written this whole sequence, um, that, that bounced back and forth between, uh, between that sort of like high action, huge um, moment, it's uh, the moment around the sort of like fake space needle um, was where it was supposed to open originally. And then it sort of goes back to the Flavella at the beginning. Um, but, uh, but I had written this whole idea where it was like, it would go back and forth between like a cinematic of Alma giving birth to the two, to the two brothers and then cut and then it just, just keep coming back to the gameplay sections of lots of high action and sort of, and the whole thing, the whole idea was, uh, to carry the sound effect of the, uh, the EKG through, uh, it, like to sort of help transition between the cinematic, all the giving birth stuff and the high action stuff. It would always have like, there would always be that sound effect in the background that sort of would be tied in. And I pitched that as a way to open the game, um, but uh, it was too expensive, basically. Um, that was what it boiled down to. Um, and I think also, um, to, to a lesser extent, I think that, I, uh, again, like I said, like the guys from Monolith really had their, really had a vision that they wanted to execute on. So, uh, so like it, it really didn't kind of fit in with what they were thinking about doing. So um, that was also part of it. Although um, it did, they did, I mean, like it, I, I remember them saying that they were, uh, that it was like, that was one of those moments was like, it's cool. It's too expensive. <laughs> um, and, uh, and really they, they wanted to, they wanted to kick off the game differently. And that's not, that's not a, you know, slight against them. That's just their, that was, it was their call to make. So, um, we fell in line. Knowing about the difficulties that went into the scrapped intro sequence, the game's final introduction sequence, which quickly thrusts players into point man's boots with very little context makes a bit more sense. 
But why does the player find themselves in a seemingly South American prison complex? And why do they find themselves fighting through a favela straight out of Rio de Janeiro afterwards? Well, there are similarly good reasons behind those. So, originally, uh, when we kind of set out to do Fear 3, uh, we had this idea that we wanted to base the, the narrative all in South America. So at the end of Fear 1, the idea was that he went and holed up in, uh, in South America for the entire duration of Fear 2. And then at some point, uh, you know, somebody, you know, he did the whole Apocalypse Now thing where he wakes up in the hotel room and he used to go to war, so he came back in the fold. So we, we had based the entire idea of Fear 3 happening in the favelas in a sort of Rio de Janeiro, uh, Sao Paulo uh, world. And we built out uh, a good amount of, of levels uh, based in that. And then, so we thought we were all, you know, really smart and come up with this really cool original premise. And, uh, and then boom, like Modern Warfare 2 came out and that was based in uh, favelas. And then uh, the Hulk movie came out, which was also kind of based there. And the people are like, ah, all right, you know, maybe I don't know what's going on. But then uh, Warner Brothers, uh, who were getting uh, kind of more and more involved in the project, uh, uh, they had started to get, you know, get with TJ to try to work out uh, locations, and they decided they wanted to kind of move the game narrative up to Pacific Northwest and sort of a post-apocalypse uh, version of Seattle, kind of where the original nuke went off at the end of Fear One. And uh, we, we had fought a lot of battles to try to keep as much of the favela stuff in, but it ended up just being the first level of the game. So if you remember the first level. You spawn in a prison in South America and you have to break your way out. So uh, even though a lot of that was reworked, that was kind of still the anchor to our first draft of Fear 3. Uh, um, yeah, it was... So yeah, I had pitched the favela as essentially being in a sort of fictional version of Brazil that like took place on this island uh, that had been taken over essentially by a corporation um, that was working with Armacan, but not necessarily Armacan. And um, uh, that was in one of the pitches. To be honest, it was so long ago. You know, I couldn't, you know, I, I can't tell you where all the ideas necessarily came from or went with. But yeah, the favela was a Brazilian favela. And, um, you know, and any number of descriptions I wrote from it with the concept art um, and even how it was built out, you know, that's how it was tended. And, you know, and it was just, it was just reappropriated because uh, we decided that the setting would be a lot more um, fruitful. Um, if we moved it to the northwest at least uh, for for the franchise rather than again originally there was this sort of idea that we were sort of rebooting the whole thing so we had to stay true to some of the tenants of the franchise but really could kind of take it in other directions um so we really kind of pulled that back in and really did our best to try to tie the fear uh story uh together uh with what had happened in the first two games one of the most fondly remembered levels in Fear 3 is that of a post-apocalyptic big box store that has been overrun by cultists worshipping Alma. From my conversations with the developers, it might also be one of the only levels that was as scary and engaging as they had concepted it to be. I mean, it started as uh, uh, the desire to, I mean, somebody was like, hey, wouldn't it be cool to be in a big Costco? It'd be all creepy and stuff. Um, and they were right. Um, but... Um, uh, it was, um, what can we use from within that place um, to make you feel like you're not that strong all of a sudden? Because um, you'll have gone through a little bit of already being a super soldier, right? You can slow down time and shoot everybody with everything. Um, so where could we put you that would make you feel at least a little bit vulnerable? Um, and we knew that we could use an enclosed area um, that's mostly dark um, and then we could also use it to try to start hinting at the effects of Alma in the rest of the world. Um, so we actually have sort of a place that was almost becoming a shrine to her. Um, and maybe even they don't know it, uh, like the, you know, whoever was left in there that, that became these cultists, like maybe they don't even know that it's a shrine. Um, they're just doing what, they think they should do and they're all kind of crazy at this point anyway um but so we wanted a combination of those uh 
those elements of just being able to kind of put you somewhere and, and hint that things are bigger than just you and maybe Armacham. Armacham. Many of Fear 3's other most memorable levels began life as something else entirely. In the case of the bridge, for example, that was as a test area. You know, at that time, just sort of trying to put together the framework of the progression. So uh, the bridge level actually came together as a, a, a evolved from a demo that we did uh, in, in an early prototype of kind of like what could, uh, you know, what does Fear 3 look like in the Pacific Northwest and our idea as well. You know, they got Lake Washington and all these big lakes. And of course, we were living out. Uh, I was living in Seattle for, for eight years when I, I worked at Microsoft. So we were kind of saying, okay, what if there was this just insanely huge bridge across the lake? And, uh, you know, what if we, so we did that for a prototype. We built like, built like a small version of that. And then that just essentially became the, the core of that level. And we just expanded it. All the stuff leading up to that, which was kind of a lower bridge and the subway cars and then getting up on top of the bridge and then taking that all the way to the point where uh, that big event happens after you get past that last checkpoint. You're like, there's like a big long bridge that you kind of like move, move through, and there's uh, you're moving through all these different like train cars and things like that. That was um, we we put that together, um, uh, aiming to make that kind of like a demo, like a gameplay demo. And so that was one of the earliest things that we sort of like worked on and put together. And that was also like uh, it sort of like helped us to sort of figure out like how the how those different like sections and how those different parts of the game would be sort of paced out in terms of balancing between like kind of like spooky atmospheric stuff versus um versus like combat stuff um and how those sort of how each level would kind of be paced out at like and sort of working with working with those guys to figure that out was also really fun like i'm so glad we got a mech battle in there and it's and it worked i mean it's pretty good it's pretty good i love that i love that bridge sequence man i've spent so much time testing that thing and it you know and it, it's not bad it plays out pretty well and those guys you know they were the battle tech guys i mean the fasa that's where that whole team comes out of another major location in fear 3's campaign the airport also began life as a test bed for gameplay systems the airport started off as our test level and basically it was just a sandbox to try things out. And we had put so much work into it, they decided to make it a level in the game. So that was that was the biggest example of reused assets. The airport was also uh, originally uh, based on uh, a, a pre-production uh, demo. So one of the first prototypes we did uh, for Fear, uh, for Fear 3, when it became Fear 3, uh, as well as the, the prison level. Uh, all of those were kind of various different visual demos, vertical slices, uh, press demos. There was an endless slew of these sort of moments when, you know, game development's weird, you know, publisher, you know, does due diligence on you, signs you up, says, you guys are the guys, let's make the game. And then a couple months later, they're like, hey, we're getting a little nervous. We want to see some really hot visuals. And so you got to, you know, chip off a small team uh, and essentially drive a bunch of demo stuff. So we had done, you know, easily half a dozen mini vertical slices and demos over the course of the, the entire production. So a lot of the final levels in Fear 3 were sort of, you know, uh, you know, they were the genesis of those were from those smaller demos. And when it came time to sort of come up with a level ideas, we already had a lot of this stuff kind of sitting around. We just thought, why don't we just, you know, save some grief and just try to develop these more and try to bring them into, uh, you know, a larger scale, a larger uh, implementation. Of the planned and concepted levels for the game, a number were cut before they entered full production. Of these were a concepted level set in a haunted Seattle underground, with the streets above viewable through holes in the ceilings. The concept art shows a series of dilapidated and claustrophobic hallways and buried parts of the old city, some set up with mannequins for tourists to admire. It's regrettable the level didn't make it in because it's a unique and effectively creepy setting for a shooter. A ship graveyard was also concepted, though it's unclear where it would have fit into the game. Another level that seemed to be based more around creating a sense of tension for the player was a concepted ferry ride that transported players from the mainland to the island laboratory where the game's climactic battle against the creep takes place. 
In the game's art style guide, the level is explained to be based more around storytelling and exploration than combat. In the final game, the brothers simply arrive at the laboratory with no explanation for how they got there. One of the most common criticisms of Fear 3's story is the rushed conclusion. While the final level does put emphasis on exploring the lab that Point Man and Fettel grew up in and discovering their past, it's ultimately a short experience that comes too little too late and funnels players into a climactic boss battle. It's truly unfortunate that levels like the Fairy and Underground, as well as additional concepts for the lab, had to be culled, as they could have given the game a better balance of action, horror, and storytelling. After everything so far, it should be no surprise that the development cycle of Fear 3 was one that wore down its developers over time. Some of these developers had worked on the project since 2006, seen countless assets and concepts scrapped, and worked tirelessly to implement things like co-op. But the crunch and burnout experienced by the team is something best expressed in their own words. Uh, it was definitely a lot of hours, um, fair and, and consistently for a while. Uh, it was for, you know, many, many months of um, you're going to, uh, and it wasn't, eventually it was, we need you to spend the extra time here. But even initially, it was just people not going home. Uh, and so no one else went home because there was more work to do. Um, so it was sort of an, an unofficial crunch initially. Eventually, it became an official crunch because we still had too much to get done in the time that we had allotted. Yeah, I never felt like I was working and nobody else was. I felt like everybody was working too much. You know, there was a really, frankly, a lot of burnout on the team at that time because there was a lot of passion for the project. And then all of a sudden they realized um, that basically it was all for naught. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's, uh, you know, artists only have one real goal in life, which is to have, which is to do good work and have it seen by the world. So uh, when you end up having to bend uh, entire levels, entire sequences, uh, characters, all kinds of designs. Uh, that's brutal, I think, for, for everybody. And, you know, uh, I Want Life Here was, a, was an amazing long project. Uh, 44 milestones, mini crunches for all of those milestones, and then the long uh, final crunch slog, which was about eight months at the end of the project. We were working, I don't know, 60 to 80 hour weeks consistently. Uh, to finish that game and uh, you know it was just it was hard it was really really hard and a lot of great people a lot of great artists designers coders uh, you know producers everybody uh, you know just at some point decided to walk away from it uh, because it was just too too long too intense I mean okay. it was a, it was a, a you know hellishly long project so we lost a good amount of people just through sort of burnout and uh, you know getting tired of this one game going on forever but uh, you know, you can go on YouTube and there you can see there's videos of the Fear 3 credits. And uh, if you just watch those and just see how many names are on that list, it sort of gives you an idea how, you know, how, how many people worked on this thing, how big the, the teams were at the end. So uh, anybody who's under special thanks is probably people who, you know, uh, ended up just saying, this is it, I'm out of here and uh, before the end of the project. And uh, there's a lot of people on that list. This small game developer of people, uh, you know, that had kind of gone through, you know, over a decade of, you know, some of them were almost two decades of working together. So they sort of had this sort of family aspect. Um, and there were many times when they said, hey, guys, we're not sure if we're going to be able to make payroll next week. Um, and we're going to have to be laying some people. Go I mean, it was, it was always sort of felt like they were two steps, you know, basically one check from Warner Brothers from uh, closing their doors. Interpersonal and inner office relationships also hindered the development of Fear 3, with some developers citing a lack of proper scoping for the project, as well as negative attitudes from other team members. I mean, it was, it was a lack of scope uh, or lack of scoping, and I understand the realities of game development, especially, you know, this many years later, uh, that, uh, you know, that's uh, the thing you have to do and that nobody does, is that you need to scope the game down to fit with what you can actually do. But instead of that, you're going to try to make something that's about 
fifty percent more than that, and eh, you'll get some of the way there. I would say there were a lot of negative attitudes on the team um, that led to poor decision making, um, and this is um, something that I won't blame on particular individuals, um, but maybe it was allowed to fester a little longer than it should, and it became a very negative working environment where I would go into, and the, you know, there were some people that knew this, um, but it's always sad when you're in a creative environment with very highly paid, talented professionals um, discussing something as cool as say like, you know, the favela scene uh, or, uh, you know, going to the airport or, you know, rent, you know a, a great battle with Alma and um, the room would be silent you know um or when someone would offer up a solution uh, the first answers uh, or responses to those ideas would be no or that's bad and negative responses right i'm a person who values my team's input because they're playing the game every day they're checking their stuff also qa is an incredible source of information just because they play the game more than anybody else um and it didn't seem like the higher ups necessarily valued the input from the team as much as they could. Um, just, and that's, to me, that was, that's, just, that's it's a shortcoming for the, uh, the style of the, the management style that was in place at day one. After six long years, Fear 3 finally released in 2011, a vastly different beast than what the team had envisioned when production began on a project called Fear 2. From the developers I interviewed, the feeling on the game's launch in the office was a mixture of relief and indifference. But despite the exhaustion the team felt, there was also a lot of pride in everything they had accomplished with Fear 3. Well, I mean, to be honest, I think we were, we kind of initially came in uh, with the Xbox version at about a 78 Metacritic, which honestly, we were considering everything we had been through, we were, we were reasonably happy with that. Uh, and, you know, the way the waiting worked, I think Giant Bomb gave us just the crappiest review ever. And that just like that brought our, our score uh, down significantly. And that was hard. But, uh, you know, we understood there was so we thought we made a pretty fun gun game. If you talk about the core devs and, you know, did we like playing it? Yeah, we liked playing it because we, we just thought we, there were some fun mechanics there. Uh, Parker Hamilton, who's now over at Sucker Punch and is one of the main designers on Ghosts of Tsushima there, uh, just did a magnificent job with systems design. So the bat weapons all felt balanced. The combat combat felt very good. Uh, ben Curitan was another uh, great designer who, who worked to make that happen. And there was a lot of people actually. Uh, and, and honestly, uh, we just felt good about that. And I think when you look at the reviews in that context, people thought it was a fun game to play. Uh, where we certainly fell down was, is it a fear game? Uh, is it coherent? <laughs> Does the story make sense? Uh, is it uh, you know, a, a worthy successor to the fear franchise? Uh, I think a lot of those comments were valid. I don't think anybody felt too, uh, at least in terms of the core dev team, I don't think any of us were too uh, disillusioned from that. I mean, it's always rough, um, you know, it was, uh... It was tough uh, for Fracture, uh, and, and then you know, worked sort of even harder on Fear, and then I think Fear had, had more going for it. Um, uh, and that when that didn't pan out, that was um, it was pretty disheartening. Um, I was still fairly young uh, in the industry at that point. I mean, I had, you know it was sort of my second game, but um, I moved into Fracture about halfway through their development on that. Um, and uh, so this was sort of the first one I'd been on pretty much from the beginning. And uh, so I was really hoping that it was going to do better. Um, so the reviews come in and they're okay, but they're not great. And the sales come in and the sales are not great uh, and not enough for us to get, you know, the next thing right away. Like I remember people being pretty pretty satisfied or at least pretty happy overall. I think, I think obviously like everybody would like to see, um, would like to see better reviews, but I honestly think that most of us were more interested in what the, in what the fans would, how they would receive it versus how, um, how it was reviewed. I think we were looking for, uh, we were, we were always kind of thinking about the players um, in terms of like, you know, what, what would be the most fun experience 
Um, so we were hoping that even if, you know, even if some aspects of the game, we didn't like, like weren't, weren't executed on the best, like, at, uh, like at the end of the day that the, that the players and the fans would be, uh, would, would, would pick it up and, and were, uh, would enjoy it. I think for me, I, 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 I talked to more than one person, um, after the fact, uh, after the game had been, had come out who just kind of felt relieved because it was a very long, uh, a very long production cycle. Um, and so because it, because it went through all these different iterations over the course of, over the course of the, I don't remember how long the actual production cycle was because I wasn't there for part of it. So, um, but I do know it was longer than usual. And so the, um, I, I know that there were a lot of people who have been on that game from the beginning who were just sort of happy to take a breath and that, uh, and, and, and sort of exhale at the end of it because it had been a long journey. And not only that, they were seeing, you know, they were seeing decent reviews come in. And, and so they, they felt like, you know, they did a good job. And, and I think that they did. I think that the game itself is pretty good. Um, I think that the, I, I routinely think back to the combat in it. Um, and I think that um, a lot of that was pretty fun. Um, and the core loop, which obviously sort of fear started of, you know, having being that soldier with slow-mo, um, but having also AI that respond appropriately, they have a sense of self-preservation um, and they'll tell you what they're thinking. So you know how smart the AI is. Um, just that loop felt good. And I felt like we hit that. Um, and also that I think we tried a bunch of stuff um, and that uh, that ended up working out and was interesting and different even within that framework. We had, you know we added mechs uh, in a more significant way, in my opinion, uh, than um, Fear Two, um, and uh, the uh, and some of the enemy types um, I thought were similarly uh, interesting comparatively. Um, so I could, you know, I'm I'm pretty proud of what we did with the game. Um, it was a rough. It was it was really rough, uh, getting it there. I think it's underrated. Like at this point, I think it has aged pretty well. Um, I think it still sounds great if you listen to it on a nice system. Listen to it with some headphones on. The set, you just made great use of kind of surround technology and. Um, it, yeah, it sounds great. I think it still looks very good. I think, um, yeah, underrated. Underrated and underappreciated is what I would say. Though it's probably fair to say that Warner Brothers cutting off the game's marketing didn't help the early sales figures in its first months. One of the issues was even though Warner Brothers made a, a couple of TV commercials and spent some money on marketing, easily two to four weeks after we shipped that that spigot was cut off so uh, we, we we had hoped to see given all the effort that went into it, we hope to see stronger uh, you know support there to sort of give the game some legs to elevate it to at least be visible uh, after so many trials and tribulations it's hard not to feel bad for the talented and hard-working developers who were clearly passionate about the project but even in the hardest working conditions Many of the developers still have fond memories of their co-workers who worked alongside them and who helped make Fear 3 come to life in a way that they could all be proud of. Just the play tests. A lot of the play tests with, um, like, trying to figure out the whole, um, oh, what's it called? Like, the, um possession system where you would like possess the dudes that was real fun um yeah a bunch of it was just like um figuring stuff out just through iteration and testing it it was it was yeah it was, it, it, i mean obviously it was real cool to be able to play fear 2 when it was still in beta um and then we would kind of have an unofficial, um, you know, cookouts and I don't know stuff like yeah, just just it's all the the fun parts of game development were fun. We went through so much and we were all cooped up in the same building for so long 
uh, that I think the core dev team, you got to understand we were split into two studios. So day one studio had a, a Chicago office and we had one in, in Hunt Valley, Maryland. And uh, that was a weird dichotomy because the Hunt Valley team culture and our team culture was, was somewhat different. And, you know, we were on video and IM and, and stuff regularly, but there was always a little bit of this sort of sort of strange uh, division there. Uh, Hunt Valley had most of the programmers or a lot of them and Chicago had most of the designers and artists, uh, but there were certainly, you know, crossover on both studios. Uh, so there was always sort of this weird, uh, not competition, but I would say there was just always this, sort of this tension of uh, the two studios. And that was kind of a recurring theme uh, throughout the development of the game. But uh, uh, I think, you know, there's, you know, not a lot of great, I would say, stories other than, uh, you know, we, we bonded really well as a core group. You know, we came together under some unbelievable circumstances and, uh, we managed to get it done. There was a lot of doubts and a lot of sort of, uh, you know, disillusionment with the process of making the game. Liked virtually all the people that I worked with. Um, and uh, um, and I liked like the work that I was doing. Um, so it was all sort of a good time, just a, just a lot of work, uh, sort of mentally rough time. Um, I mean, I'm still in contact with a number of the people that I worked with on that project. Um, one of the things that was, uh, that kind of helped bring it around a little bit uh, was when we played multiplayer for this game, because we knew kind of what multiplayer had been like on fear and it was kind of eh, not really, not really something that worked out. I don't think um, just cause it was, it's very difficult to get that kind of slow-mo combat thing to, to happen in, in multiplayer and otherwise they're just a shooter which is fine but um, nothing super exciting so when our multiplayer team um, which was a very small number of people um, and we were making a multiplayer because you have to right uh, especially at that time um, they put out three or four different multiplayer modes that were very different than any stuff I had, I had played up until that point and that was just cool. Like everybody kind of got together and we were playing it and this was fun. Um, and a different one where you, uh, you're you like um, a spirit wandering around and like ticking over different enemy types. Um, and that was cool uh, to fight each other as a bunch of different types of enemies. Um, and then when we finally came out with fucking run, uh, and of course we all joked, you know, that should totally be the name of it. That is, yeah, yeah, they'll never name it that. And then they decided, yeah, right, why not? We'll just call it fucking run. Um, and that was just cool to play. Like we would, uh, you know, it'd be some of us and then QA would um, get together. There was a little bit of a bullpen in uh, the Hunt Valley office. So we would kind of all get together in the same area and play through um, those sections of just getting into the space and uh, there are guys in between you and here, and you've got to get there before that wall of death behind you gets to you. And um, and we were just having a ball. Um, and it was one of those things that sort of helped you kind of reframe what you were working on, um, that there was more to it. Um, and uh, that it would, and we could just kind of, and especially for those of us who weren't working on it directly, because it was new, um, we could play it and relax a little bit and, and just sort of have fun um, playing the multiplayer of this game that we're just desperately trying to finish the single player campaign of. Actually, I worked a lot with the uh, designer that was in charge of multiplayer. Every day at lunch, we'd have multiplayer play sessions and give feedback and whatnot, and pretty much everybody who was involved in them. Like at the time, I was playing a ton of Call of Duty multiplayer, and everybody had their own game. Um, that they were playing that had multiplayer. So we had a lot of different ideas coming in to, and our, our goal was to kind of make it not your, not your typical multiplayer, but uh, that the multiplayer and the, uh, of oh, the mode where you had like the dark cloud coming up behind you that forced you to move forward. Those are two of the things that I think worked really well in that game. We had a, just a great time building and testing, you know, great levels together. Um, we'd spend, you know, an hour or so every day kind of playing builds 
Um, and, you know, there was just so much talent there. I had a lot of friends there and we built great things. I think for me, what was most exciting was really getting into horror. Um, you know, one of the harder things for me was going in and these guys who were amazing, talented people would like be working on blood splatters for months, dismemberment months. And I thought, man, I don't know. I just, I just don't know if that's a great use of use of their talents. And I, I sort of felt bad for them to some extent. It's like, how many times can you do a blood spatter? Does it really get that much better? But man, they had to do it over and over and over and over and over. Um, so, um, you know, for me to, to jump into, you know, I, I hadn't, I just hadn't worked in horror before. So it was a really great opportunity to really get in there. And they gave me a lot of great development and training. So it was a, uh, it was a real honor to be part of it. I think my favorite thing working on the project, well, my two favorite things I think were recording the VO with everybody was really fun. Um, getting to work with uh, some of the, some of the best guys in the industry and um, from the actors to the, to the engineers, to the director, the voiceover director's name uh, was Chris Borders, who's worked on, I mean, you can go, look and look at his uh credits list it's a it's a mile and a half long um but uh but you know getting to work with those guys was really really special um and i think the other thing that i think was there there were there are just little snippets of gameplay moments that are really that i think really worked really well for what they were um i i i know you interviewed matt mason and um Matt and I worked together pretty heavily on the there's a there's a point in time and there's a there's a part in the in the game where uh where you're in a um sort of like a big box sort of Costco like store and um you go through the electronics section where you got all these TVs on the walls and everything and we used that like as like a like back in the old days when they used to have like cameras and you could like stand in front of the camera and they used to put you used to be able to see yourself in the TVs. They used to have all that stuff hooked up all the time. So we played with that idea by having like this this uh, this concept of being able of, of like seeing the uh, the sort of crazed Denzians of of uh, of the town sort of like moving in the in the in the screens and you and and then occasionally we would throw like an actual body in front of it, like a guy runs past and you can't really tell sometimes like it would it would freak people out because they weren't sure if they saw that on the screen or if they saw it on or if that was like actually a real person um and it, it was uh it was something that we really worked out the timing of and the and everything like really we worked a, like matt and i worked really hard to get that just right and um the uh so like when it like seeing it come together i think visually it worked incredibly well um from like from that perspective and so that was i just remember having a lot of fun working on that section and seeing that come together during my time interviewing developers i spoke to several team members who refused to be interviewed citing professional or personal backlash that they were honest about their time on the team be it due to crunch interpersonal relationships or whatever other reasons they had it's clear to me that even more than a decade after its release fear 3 has left its share of scars on the team Fear 3 remains an imperfect game. For many, it will always be a disappointing conclusion to the series, and some may even wish it remained forgotten as they cling to more happy memories of Fear and Fear 2. But I don't think Fear 3 deserves to be forgotten. When I first set out to make this documentary, I had no idea the tumultuous developments I would uncover. From the cancelled version of Fear 2 to implementing co-op, and struggling with the game's tone to cut enemies and environments, Fear 3 was a constant struggle for the developers who made it. The crunch and burnout the team had to endure would never have been worth it, even if Fear 3 turned out to be a stone-cold classic. But in the end, the hard work and creativity they dedicated to the project deserves to be recognized. If only to imagine what Fear 3 could have been unrestrained by corporate mandates and the need to follow market trends. Fear 3 was the last game in the series, and a financial disappointment for many reasons but a lack of passion, care, or talent on the team weren't among those reasons. Fear 3 may have deserved better, but not nearly as much as the people who made it.
Hello everybody and thank you for watching. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and do all the other stuff that will help the algorithm get me noticed. I want to send a very special thanks to all the developers who sat down for these interviews. I obviously couldn't have very well done it without them. If you follow me on social media or have followed my work at other outlets, you know that this video has been a long time coming and it has been a lot of hard work and truly a labor of love for me to get through. I found myself quite affected uh, by the story of the Fear 3 team, and while there was so much stuff I wasn't able to get in, I hope that I did justice to their efforts on the game. That having been said, I would really, really love to continue making these, but I can only afford to do it if I start making more money on Patreon. If you enjoyed this video, the very least I'll ask you to do is please share it on your own social media channels, tell other people to watch it, because what I really need is more eyes on it and more patrons and uh, people donating to my Ko-Fi so I can turn this into a full-time gig. I have such a love of telling these stories from the ones I've done previously on Just Add Monsters with Condemned 2 and X-Men Origins Wolverine, and there are no shortage of games I'd like to continue documenting the development of in the future, but I really, really, really need these videos to be doing better than they are right now for the effort to be worth it. As always, thank you for watching, and I will see everybody next time.